Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Josh. I do a lot of videos on IT, cybersecurity, education, and career stuff. And this video is just going to be a continuation of the cybersecurity interview practice questions. So again, in these videos, I'm just gonna kind of go through this list of practice questions. You can see the list in the description. Um, I just do my best to like answer them as I would answer them in an interview. So I go into kind of like an answer mode. And then after I answer the individual questions, I'll just do kind of a, an explanation of the question at the end. So getting right into it, the next question question is, what is SSL? So SSL stands for Secure Socket Slayer. It's just a technology used to encrypt traffic over the internet. This kind of falls into a group with TLS and SSL. A lot of people use the two terms interchangeably, but SSL is actually deprecated. Like all versions of SSL is deprecated and it's currently replaced by TLS, which stands for Transport Layer Security. So this question is pretty basic. There's a lot more you can say about TLS and SSL. Um, probably if somebody asks you what SSL is, you'll probably get bonus points for telling them that it's deprecated and you know, bonus points for saying like, you know, use TLS 1.3 or, or 1.2. I know, I think 1.3 is live, but a lot of places still use like TLS 1.1 and 1.2, even though technically, you know, TLS 1.1, I, I believe is technically deprecated, but it's basically just a way to secure traffic over the internet. Of course, SSL 3, for example, is better than using no encryption, but all versions of SSL are, are deprecated. So the next question is, uh, what are the difference between HTTPS, SSL, and TLS? So HTTPS is just suggesting the HTTP is in use, but it's being secured one way or another either usually by SSL or TLS. SSL and TLS are just ways to encrypt traffic uh, as it traverses the internet. So for example, if you go to like a website that's like HTTPS colon slash slash Google dot com or something like this, um, you can assume that it's being encrypted one way or another. Uh, SSL is deprecated. All versions of SSL are deprecated. And most websites are using probably like TLS 1.2 or 1.3, although TLS 1.1 is in use uh, on a lot of websites still today. So basically the difference is HTTPS is just suggesting that HTTP is secured one way or another. And then SSL and TLS are just different ways to encrypt traffic to and from the internet. So in my opinion, this is kind of a trick question a little bit because it's kind of implying like like HTTPS, SSL, and TLS are kind of all the same thing, but they're not they're not really the same thing. Like TLS and SSL are like specific protocols and HTTPS is just kind of suggesting, um, it's just saying like, you know, HTTP is being secured uh, one way or another. So they're not really, my opinion, they're not really in the same class, but it's kind of a, it's kind of a good way to gauge like the knowledge of the person you're interviewing, if they can like make the differentiation between those three things. So kind of make sure you understand understand TLS and SSL, at least at a superficial level, understand SSL has been deprecated and then know what like HTTPS is. And the next question is, what is a SSL TLS handshake? So SSL TLS handshake is describes what happens when a client makes some kind of connection to a server over TLS and SSL. Now, a lot of things happen in the handshake and I, I don't actually know the super intricate details of what happens in the TLS handshake, but I know, I know like a TCP connection is made, like from the, the client will send a SYN, the server will send SYN ACK, and then the client will send an ACK. Uh, a TCP session will be established, and I know that the, the client will request the public key or the digital certificate from the server. The client will then kind of use that public key to an, to create an encrypted tunnel between the client and the server. And then the asymmetric key, I believe, will be exchanged between the two. And then uh, essentially a, a connection, a secure tunnel or connection will be made between in between the client and the server. And I know I know like a, a lot of other stuff happens during this time, like uh, they'll negotiate cipher suites to use, like they'll negotiate what's the strongest, you know, symmetric and asymmetric algorithms both end can use. And they'll kind of negotiate other things too, like inside the cipher for suite, but I, I don't have a, a full understanding of actually what goes on inside of the whole handshake, but that's kind of my superficial understanding of it. And so this question, um, this is a really good question. It's good to know like, you know, what the TLS SSL handshake is. I don't actually know the in-depth details of it. And that's that's how I would have answered it. If someone would have asked me like point blank, um, you can dive into it a little bit deeper and then maybe, maybe find out a little bit more and practice answering to answer it a little bit better. But basically like it's, it's just like, um, 
what happens between, you know, when I, when you browse to a website from your personal computer and say like the Google web server, for example, like when you initially browse to Google, like the TLS handshake takes place and a lot of stuff is negotiated, a connection is made, then a, a kind of secure tunnel is made. So yeah, I definitely read up on this a little bit more. That was my kind of answer. It was a little bit superficial, could have been better, but I guess it is what it is. And the next question is, what sorts of anomalies would you look for to identify a compromised system? So when you say anomalies, that kind of implies that there's some kind of baseline present. Um, but if I'm just speaking generally, I might say, you know, increased CPU utilization, like increased memory utilization, uh, increased network or other resources, like in increased use of other resources that is like greater than normal, I would say, or maybe like the computers reaching out to a some kind of web server or some kind of endpoint on the internet at really fixed intervals. So for example, like every exactly like every 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, or some exact like, you know, obviously machine initiated uh, initiation sequence or anything like kind of out of the, the ordinary. Like if it's on an endpoint, it might be the users kind of noticing the computers slower than usual or any other kind of behavior that differentiates from the normal. I suppose that's what the, the definition is of an anomaly is something that's like not normal for a system. So that that's pretty much the best answer that I could come up with like on the spot there's probably other things that you can you know that you could kind of say but because they used anomaly that kind of that kind of indicates that they're looking for the answer of something outside of the ordinary like something that falls outside of the normal baseline of utilization of resources or or whatever so you can probably google this one maybe come up with a better answer than what I gave but um, if someone told me what I just told you I'd be like uh, okay they have a decent understanding of it I guess uh, so yeah, that's that one. So the next question and the kind of last one for this video is if you had to both compress and encrypt data during a transmission, which would you do first? Uh, so for my answer, if I had to both compress and encrypt data, uh, I would definitely compress it first and then encrypt it and then transmit it. This is because data compression typically re relies on redundancies in the data. So for example, like the more redundancies that exist in any given data, the more you'll be able to compress it. And once you encrypt something, it kind of reduces the redundancy a lot and kind of uh, essentially scrambles the data, potentially like more than likely reducing the amount of redundancies in the data. So definitely compress the data first and then encrypt it and then transmit it. If you do this, the size of the data being transmitted will be much less. If you were to encrypt it first, it's gonna remove a lot of the redundancy from the data. And then when you go to compress it, the compression algorithm won't really work that well. This is one of my favorite questions just because it's so interesting and it, it really like shows your fundamental understanding of uh, how compression and encryption work. And there's no way I would know this if I didn't like read this question before. Um, or if you if you've done computer science, you would probably know. I remember like in like 2009, I was doing I think it's 2009 or maybe 10. I was in data structures and algorithms like Java 3 and we had to build a, a Huffman tree. And at that point, I kind of learned learned like the more redundancies there are in data, like the greater the compression will be. And you can kind of see this. Um, actually, I'll show you right here. It's really interesting. So for example, I'll make a text file, right? I'll, it doesn't matter. I'll just name it like whatever. And I'll just fill it with X's. This, this is very interesting, by the way. So you can see this. Let me make it big, as big as possible, not as big as possible. But anyway, fill, I made a text file. You can see it's like it's all X's and it's like 133 megabytes. And watch this send to zip and then guess guess how big this compressed file will be look it became it became 1kb that's like that's like a factor of like my math is bad maybe a factor of like a thousand or something like this and on disk this is like the smallest amount of space that it can take up on the disk so basically like what this what this compressed into was like you know however many x's are it the compression ratio just says like repeat x like a million point four times something like this whereas if this text file was something like you know, crazy, like a whole bunch of random different things, like the compression ratio is going to be, you know, much worse. For example, I'll show you. Let's see if I can, if I can do this. Uh, random string generator. I'll generate. Yeah, we'll do this. Get strings. So I'll just get all these random text here. I'll just do this, for example. You see how big this one is? Oh, it's almost the same size. So 1.3, and if I if I compress this, 
you'll see, you know, it's it's compressed quite a bit, but it's definitely larger than the other one. So that, that kind of shows, um, you can see like one KB to like 23 KB. So it's it's very interesting. Like the more redundancy that exists in data, the greater it's going to compress, if that makes sense. That's probably a pretty a pretty good depiction of that. So yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, it's a really good question. That's really interesting. And if you can answer this question well, it kind of shows like the the depth of your knowledge, I guess, because it's kind of one of those like, it seems like trivia, but it's, it's not really. It kind of shows like how deep you understand certain things, or it's kind of like, I guess, a litmus test to see like you know I, I guess what you know i don't know i guess that's trivia but anyway i hope you enjoyed these uh interview questions i try to answer them as naturally as i can uh so if you like these you know feel free to like and subscribe and if you have any questions you know you want me to elaborate or if you thought i answered anything wrong or gave misinformation just let me know in the comment section i'll i'll pin any corrections that anyone makes uh but yeah thanks so much for watching and look forward to the next one bye bye